awesome, awesome. Okay, it's great to be together. Even the winter weather is starting to roll on in. Amen? Amen. 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 Like you, it's a bit colder than you may be sitting. Sit. Um, We're continuing our series on discipleship, and there's just a couple of weeks left. Amen? So I hope you are ready to hear Nick when preach the word, not next week, but the week after. And you got to take care of our brother. Amen? Amen. As he's going to lead us, because I'll be in Cape Town um, during Easter. Okay, um, it's, uh, it's incredible to um, look at the different accounts of discipling in the Bible. So I saw the advice from different brothers here. What do you feel, you know, the ICM uh, um, graduates and, and, and uh, you know, even like semi-scholars in the church and stuff like that. So, so I get different answers. What's a great book on discipling? One is, oh, the book of Luke is great for, you know, practical. And then it just simply says, but the, the whole Bible covers the cycle. I was like, hey, man, that is a good answer. So all the books in the Bible you can really study for it. But, but um, uh, of course you get the pastoral, uh, pastoral letters, which is, uh, you know, the Timothys and, and the, um, the Tituses and, and the Jews and stuff like that. So we're just going to simply have a little summary of that. Today we're going to look at Titus. Um, next week we've got a, a, a little lesson on... Um, really uh, autonomy. Uh, let, next week we're going to look at autonomy and Nick will finish us off with a summary um, on, on the other pastoral legend which is uh, First and Second Timothy. Amen. So today's title is very simply um, Titus, the eyewitness account of discipling. Wow. Titus, Titus, the eyewitness account of discipling. Okay, so first thing is uh, the, the word Titus. Okay, it means uh, huge. It means big. And uh, of course um, Titus gets converted in the Bible and there we say he was a spiritual uh, a giant in the end, like his name indicates, but he didn't start off as a spiritual giant. So that's a lesson enough for us. So we all got to be growing, and as you start out, you may not be a giant, but your goal needs to be to become a spiritual giant. Question: How much have you grown? How much have you grown spiritually? You know, Titus was a was an interesting character. His name appears eight times in Second Corinthians. Now, if you know, um, some water. Yeah, no. Just make sure everybody's taken care of. Um, um, the, word, uh, the name Titus appears eight times in Second Corinthians. Now, if you remember the church in Corinth, what was what type of church was it? A big church. It was a big church, okay. And what else do you see in the letter right there? There were some issues, right? Yeah. Sexual immorality, that all kind of stuff going on in Corinth. So someone even said, um, you know, LasVegas.com. The city in Corinth may have been where lots of artists and performers and even prostitutes and different people had been as the ships come in and out. And there was no real locals. Everyone was passing through. And so we see here some characteristics about Titus coming on out. In Galatians, um, he is uh, addressed uh, as one who Paul took along with to the council in Jerusalem. Uh, Acts 15. Remember there was a council in Jerusalem where there's a question, should the, um, uh, should the uncircumcised believers now become circumcised? And so from all this we learn even that Titus stayed uncircumcised. And then in Galatians it even addresses him and it says that he was from Greek background. Okay, so we know a few little things about him right there. Let's go on in uh, as we're going to study the book of Titus today. Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1. Are you guys fired up to learn about Titus today? Amen. 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 Um, I can feel a little fire in the church right there. I know that uh, Francisco has that, barely had any sleep, but he's so fired up. He's just like a, you know, the, the energizer bunny right there. <laughs> you know, he's, <laughs> he's jumping around. He's got that, that fire in him right there. And uh, um, it's, it's, it's great to be studying a book of uh, Titus. Amen. Um, Titus 1 verse 1 to 4. Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to further the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to God. And you see, you can further your knowledge of the truth. And how do you do that? By learning the Word of God. How is your quiet time this morning? Are you in the Word of God? Verse 2. In the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie. See, Paul had to address something here with the church. Not many introductions says God doesn't like lie. But right in the beginning, he had to know that God doesn't lie. Amen. Why? We learn a little bit more about the, 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 the place where Titus was sent to about their character. Okay, it doesn't like promised before the beginning of time. Whew. And which is now um, at his appointed season, he has brought to light to the preaching and trusted to me by the command of God our Savior. To Titus, my true son in our common faith. 
I mean, wow, what an introduction. Grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. You know, it's amazing that God appointed eternal life before the beginning of time. Okay, so you know all those guys who said that uh, everything has always existed and there's no time or limited time? Here it says the beginning of time. Amen. Wow. <laughs> so you can you can even you can even turn an atheist straight to the Bible and say, here, it says the Bible the Bible says there was a beginning of time. So when God created the universe, there was a you know, bang, God spoke a bang, there was the universe, amen? amen. It was God's big bang. Anyway. We get an introduction of Titus right here. It says Paul's son. It says my true son in the faith right there. I want to read a little um, background here that I um, found. One of my favorite com commentators is William Barclay. You may have seen his stuff right there. I recommend it. I don't know if everything is 100%, but you eat the fish and spit the bones out. Amen? We do not know a great deal about Titus, to whom this letter was written. But from the scattered references to him, there emerges a picture of a man who's one of Paul's most trusted and most valuable helpers. I mean, Paul was a pretty strong guy, so that says something about him. Paul calls him my true son, so it's most likely that he himself converted him, perhaps at Iconium. Titus was the companion of an awkward and difficult time. When Paul paid uh, his visit to Jerusalem to uh, a church which suspected him, and was prepared to mistrust and dislike him, it was Titus whom he took along with him, along with Barnabas, Galatians 2 verse 1. A certain Scottish cultural hero, it was said that he will go out with you in any kind of weather. Now, if you've been to Scotland, they've got some bad weather right there. <laughs> <laughs> um, when Paul was up against it, Titus was by his side. There we say he would go out in any kind of weather. Titus was the man for a tough assignment. When the trouble at Corinth was at its peak, it was he who was sent with one of the severest letters Paul ever wrote, 2 Corinthians 8.16. Titus clearly had the strength of mind and toughness of fiber, which enabled him to face and to handle a difficult situation. I mean, this guy was just a man of grit. There are two kinds of people. I really love this. There are people who can make a bad situation worse, <laughs> and there are those people who can bring order out of chaos amen. and peace out of strife. Amen? Titus was the man to send to the place where there was trouble. He had a gift for practical administration. It was Titus whom Paul chose to organize the collection for the poor members of the church at Jerusalem, 2 Corinthians 8, 6 and 8, 10. It is clear that he had no great gifts of speech, but he was the man for the practical administration. Wow. The church ought to thank God for the people to whom we turn whenever we want a practical job <coughs> done well. Amen? Amen? That's a little bit of an introduction about Titus right there. Now, if you read the book, to me, there's a few things that are repeated, and it tells us about it. In the next verse, you'll see that um, uh, he was sent to uh, an island called Crete. Now, of course, quite early on in the missionary journeys, which church gets planted? The island of Crete. The church gets planted quite early on right there. But um, one of the things that you see uh, right here is that there's a repeated theme in the book of Titus. Just three chapters. And it is a pastoral letter. It tells Titus how to sort things out in the church. But three things which get um, repeated right there. The first is self-control and discipline. Self-control and discipline. I mean, you have a church with a problem, you've got to go sort out the self-control and discipline right there. People must be devoted to doing good. What's the point? They weren't doing good. <laughs> Amen. Um, and then the last one is, they had to have sound doctrine. You see, ever heard of standing water gathering full? Mm -hmm. so they were doing good right there. What's that to do with the doctrine? It got a little murky. You know, and then when you got the pond there with the murkiness right in, now how do you get the pond clean? You gotta put a catfish in. You know, the, the catfish with the was was with barber. And you put it in the pond right there, guess what happens after a few days? Start getting clean. 
Dare we say we need a few spiritual catfish in the church? Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Titus was a spiritual catfish right there. Let's go through it as we uh, look at point number one. The fail-safe way to keep the safe safe. The fail-safe way to keep the safe safe. Of course, what are we talking about? Retention rate. You know, there's all the talk about when you baptize someone, you've got to make sure you baptize a disciple. Because if you just bring someone in, hey, I'm ready, and you don't even, you know, don't meet the standards, whatever, and you just, okay, it's good to go. You want to get baptized? You're good to go. Now that person quickly falls away. The parable of the sower. Okay? So we've got to make sure that we make people who will show themselves to be disciples into disciples. So, retention rate is getting achieved how? This is the fail-safe way to keep the safe safe. Verse 5 to 9 of Titus 1. The reason I left you in Crete was that you might put in order what was left unfinished. Whew. Okay, someone started the job but not finished it, okay? And appoint elders, in other words, there could be shepherds, appoint shepherds in every town as I directed you. An elder must be blameless, faithful to his wife, a man whose children believe and are not open to charge of being wild and disobedient. Since an overseer manages God's household, he must be blameless, not be overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. Wow, that is a cranking individual right there. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. You see here that um, Titus comes into town and there's a mess. There's a great big mess in the church. What does he have to do? He has to finish unfinished business. Mm -hmm. He has to make sure that there are things that are out of order, get sorted out. And then it says he must appoint shepherds. Mm -hmm. What is the fail-safe way to keep the saved in the church saved? Shepherds. And then, wasn't Jesus himself the good shepherd? And then he just goes through a list. Let's look at what he talks about right here. He must be blameless. Okay, no one is innocent. But blameless is to be above reproach. Faithful to his wife. A man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. Okay, so the kid's got to be brought up in the faith. Since an overseer manages God's household, he must be blameless. Again, it's repeated. Not overbearing, not quick-tempered, and given to drunkenness. So now you see the parenting things coming through here. Overbearing or quick-tempered. You can't have those. Not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. So this person needs to have a heart of gold. Rather, he must be hospitable. Okay? I love it when uh, when I come over to Nick's house, he's always got a little sandwich there for me. <laughs> I don't know if any of you have had some of these sandwiches. That's a great example. One who loves what is good, who is self-controlled. Wow. Upright, holy, and disciplined. You know what's interesting right here? It mentions self-control and discipline in the same sentence. Some people take this discipline for self-control or self-control for discipline. No, no. <laughs> you've got to be self-controlled and you've got to be disciplined. Amen? Yeah. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message that's been taught. When you got made into a disciple, you've got to firmly hold on to it, not deviate from it. So that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. So we see a shepherd is someone who needs to encourage, but he also needs to refute false teaching. I want to read you a little excerpt here about um, this is a cool book. It's called A Shepherd's View of Psalm 23. Now, I've heard people speak about this. Never forget in Cape Town when it was a message, this, this short guy come, uh, he said he was a shepherd boy when he grew up. And I was like, whoa. And he drew all kinds of stuff out of Psalm 23. I was like, wow, that's an entire sermon in Psalm 23. Mm -hmm. 
Here's this guy's personal experience. Now, he had his own sheep, and then he wrote this book about shepherding people. In, in, in the, the Psalms, the, the way, the heart of the shepherd is, he who watches over you will not slumber. I mean, isn't that our God? God loves us so much that he cares about us 24-7. When we wake, when we sleep, everything, he keeps his eye, one eye open, his two ears open. Amen. In spite of having such a master and owner, the fact remains that some Christians are still not content with God's control. They are somewhat dissatisfied, always feeling that somehow the grass beyond the fence must be a little greener. Anyone can relate to that? <laughs> These are carnal Christians. One might almost call them fence crawlers or half Christians. Now, the term will be explained in a minute. Who want the best of both worlds. I once owned a you whose conduct exactly typifies this sort of person. She was one of the most attractive sheep <laughs> that ever belonged to me. Her body was beautifully portioned. She had a strong constitution and an excellent coat of wool. Her head was clean, alert, well set, and with bright eyes. She bore sturdy lamps uh, that matured rapidly. I mean, it sounds like the type of you you would want to have, amen? But in spite of all these attractive attributes, she had one pronounced fault. She was restless, discontent, a fence crawler, so much that I came to call her Mr. Gadabout. Sounds like a little American term, but anyway. <laughs> this one you produced more problems for me than almost the rest of the entire flock sure. combined. Yeah. <laughs> no matter what field or pasture the sheep were in, <coughs> she would search all along the fence or shoreline look for a little loophole she could crawl through and start to feed on the other side. Wow. <laughs> you come by and ah, it's on the other side and, and you know want to pull the, 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 the sheep back. It was not that she lacked pasturage. See, someone looked after her. My fields were my joy in the life. No sheep in the district had better grazing. With Mrs. Gad about it was and in, in, um, ingrained habit. She was simply never contented with the things as they were often when she was forced her way through, uh, has forced her way through some spot in the fence and found a way around um, the end of the wire at the low tide on the beaches. She would end up feeding on bare, brown, burnt up pasturage of the most inferior sort. It isn't always greener. But she never learned her lesson and continued to fence crawl time after time. Now, it would have been bad enough if she was the only one who did this. It was a sufficient problem to find her back uh, and find her and bring her back. But she further but the further point was that she taught other lambs to do the same. This, they simply followed her example and soon were skilled at escaping, escaping as her mother. Even worse, however, was the example she set to the other sheep. In short time, she began to lead others through the same <coughs> holes and over the same dangerous paths down by the sea. After putting up with her perverseness for the summer, I finally came to a conclusion that to save the rest of the flock, from becoming unsettled, she would have to go. I could not allow one obstinate discontent at you to ruin the whole ranch operation. Sure. Okay, so the focus is not now really taking out the, <laughs> the um, taking out the you. But the point is, this guy was a shepherd and he found those fence crawlers. The church in Crete was full of fence crawlers. Oh, maybe it's a little bit greener on that side. A little bit, and what happens to the sheep? Finds a little hole through the, the fence, crawls through, and then malnutrition. There's no good food that side. Do you know what disciples are like? Sheep. Maybe that should have been my title. My point. Disciples are like sheep. We tend to go our own way, you know, we're stupid, we're <laughs> all, all that stuff. And, and you know what's amazing about uh, um, sheep is that they will follow the goat. They will follow the goat. 
Because they say, oh, it's just like another sheep, I'm going to follow. They have no discretion. And so, in a big way, to fix the problems in the church, what do we need? Shepherds. Let's go to John chapter 10. John chapter 10. Don't forget that there was this question about elders. In the former movement, the elders were appointed always in pairs. And you do find that in the Bible that there's usually two uh, shepherds in whatever place. And culturally, we know that the word elder means what? The older. <laughs> the oldest guy in the village, he, he tells you the most wisdom. But is that always true? No. David was more wise than some of the old guys among him. He could lead them. In fact, he did lead them. Never forget when, when my brother taught this, um, this lesson about shepherding. See that, look, in the, in the former days, there was a bit of a misconception that um, to call the leader of the church pastor was wrong. And of course the point was the leader of the church is not the elder. He's the evangelist. But after some deeper study it was more shown that the leader of the church should be the best shepherd of the people. So if the best shepherd of the people's job title becomes evangelist, who needs to do the shepherding? The next best person. <laughs> Amen. So that's why you call them the shepherd. Let's read John 10 verse 1. Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The one who enters the, by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listens to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who come uh, uh, have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the, uh, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. And we know that Jesus is the way. Amen. The truth and the life. They will come in and go out and find pastures. The thief only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that the man of life and have it to the full. I mean, that's Jesus Christ. Verse 11 simply says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And then it goes into the hired hand. The hired hand doesn't care for the sheep. They just run away when the wolf comes. Do you know what is the key to retention in the church to make sure that the, the saved stay safe? We need shepherds in the church. Now, what is a shepherd? It's someone who can manage his own affairs well, and therefore he can manage the church's affairs well. It simply says right here that Jesus would lay down his life for the sheep. Believe it or not, you don't have to be 30 or 50 or any age in order to be a shepherd in God's church. We need shepherds. What is a shepherd? A shepherd is someone who has got character. A shepherd is someone who knows his Bible. A shepherd is someone who can convict other people with the word of God about their sin and can bring structure and leadership. The evangelist needs to be on the battlefield all the time. Can he go and sort out a domestic issue? Can he go and do all these things right here? He doesn't always have the time. We need incredible shepherds in the church. Of course, in London, we had this uh, tall man, <laughs> Michael Hart. He's got a great heart. But you see the shepherd there in the fellowship, a little bit tall right there. You know, you just get a little bit small. Like, I'm going to listen to this shepherd. <laughs> but he had an incredible heart. He discipled me on many things. And usually things I didn't expect. And guess what? The re retention rate, in that sense, and where he'd been directly involved, has been great. We need to make sure we practice this fail-safe way and that we are not all fence crawlers. Imagine everyone stepped up and acted like a shepherd instead of like a fence crawler. Oh, I wonder if it's, you know, along the fence here, maybe there's something greener on this side, maybe there's something greener on that side. What is the heart of a shepherd? To love the sheep. If you love your children, will you discipline them? 
What does the shepherd need to do? He needs to protect, and yes, at times, he needs to even discipline. Do you have a shepherd's heart? You know, the Bible says right there, where we read in Titus, in verse, verse 9, very interesting to me, it says, He can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. I mean, he needs to have his Bible on straight. Is a shepherd evangelistic? Is a shepherd evangelistic? Mm -hmm. Yeah! I mean, he's living it out. He's sharing his faith. He's in Bible studies. He's doing all that. He's looking after his family. And what else does he do? He looks after the flock. He can, he can um, shepherd their hearts. It says right there, by encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. You know the other um, translation says that um, refute right there? It says, and convict those who oppose it. He needs to be able to convict people. You know, if you sit in a Bible study, that person is right there, he's not really responding. Are you able to take the Word of God and do a Bible study and, and convict that person? You know when someone's convicted? There's a little bit of an emotional response. You look at Jesus heating it up with the Pharisees. The Pharisees are lukewarm. They don't want to believe. They've got bad doctrine, everything. Jesus says a few things like, mm, you see the Spirit coming out in these guys. If you cannot convict someone with the Word of God, you lack shepherding ability. How do, how do you learn it? I believe it comes through prayer. I believe it comes through imitation. I believe it comes through knowing your Bible. And it comes through a heart of wanting to be like Jesus Christ. Do you have a shepherd's heart this morning? In this church, as we grow, we will have to retain young people that come in and get baptized. Who wants to see a lot of people fall away? And yet, Jesus Christ, the best disciple of them all, who did he lose? Judas Iscariot. I spoke to this, this brother one time and said, Oh, you know, being so zealous about the mission and everything is just futile because so many people fall away. And blah, blah, blah. I said, how many people have fallen away? And he said, uh, I think this one's in that one. I said, you know, if you take one out of 12, Jesus' uh, ministry, and you take the percentage, I mean, uh, it's 8.5%. Imagine 8.5% of everyone we baptize fall away. Oh, no, 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 no. This church, oh, no, no, you're doing the wrong thing. Many people are falling away. You're not doing it right. No. To be a shepherd, you've got to be evangelistic and strongly. And you will lose some people. But let me tell you, if you want to retain people in this church, everyone needs to learn to be an effective shepherd. Are you with me, church? You know, in order to know our doctrine well, we need to know the first principles well. We've come to the end of quarter one. We've had some goals. I think some of them we've hit, some of them we haven't hit. But there's still a couple of weeks. We still have to go after it. Amen? The church's goals need to be met. But in Q2, we're setting new goals. One of the goals of setting for the church in Q2 is, is what? We're going to do the first principles classes. So we're getting together Wednesday, after Wednesday, after Wednesday, and we will all teach on the scriptures, and then at the end there will be a little quiz. Now, the, the, we need to pass the quiz, I mean. You can't know, <laughs> you can't get an airplane there, and, the, and the, you, know, you ask, uh, how much did you get for your, um, your pilot's license? No, I just edged it. 41%. I mean, are you going to get in that airplane? <laughs> we need to make sure everyone in the church knows their first principles. So we have a little quiz afterward. We'll take track of how much you know. You know, I really love that because being tested helps us to be even disciplined. You know what's great about learning the first principles series? You go out there on the street with a different confidence. You go in there with a, like a, you know, you know, sparkle in your eye, and you're like, hey, you want to come study the Bible? Yeah, yeah, I can share it right now. Uh, just bring a change in the church. Are you guys excited about having the first principle series? We're going to have that in Q2, amen? Let's go to point number two. Before you do that, verse 10 to 16, please catch up with me. That is one. For there are many rebellious people full of meaningless talk and deception, especially those of the circumcision group. They must be silenced because they are disrupting whole households and teaching things that ought not to be taught. And, for, uh, and that for the sake of dishonest gain. See, people are so used to being religious whenever they're like, I'm a Christian now, I'm still going to try and, you know, jimmy for position here and make, make money and all that. But well, one of Crete's own prophets has said it. Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, and lazy gluttons. <laughs> wow! 
I meet those questions there are different people. And today you can fly and you can get on an airplane and fly to Greece. You don't see the people there. <laughs> this saying is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply so that they will be sound in their faith and will pay no attention to Jewish myths or the merely human commands of those who reject the truth. To the pure, all things are pure, and those who are corrupted and do not believe, nothing is pure. In fact, both their minds and consciences are corrupted. They claim to know God, but their actions, by their actions they deny Him. Wow, isn't that a sermon on its own? People claim to know God, but you look at their actions, they, they deny Jesus. They are detest, detestable, disobedient, unfit for doing anything good. Whew. You know, sometimes you can have a little creep creep into our lives. A little creep creep in onto our church. What does it say there? They were, they are always, I mean, this must have been heard. Imagine you're known as someone who's always a liar. Sure. You're an evil brute. And you're a lazy glutton. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, imagine those people. And then what does Paul say? This statement is true. <laughs> Talk about the challenge as a parent. I mean, I think that was a little challenge right there. You know what's amazing? The city of Crete, uh, sorry, the, the island of Crete was called the island of a thousand cities. I never knew. I thought it was like one city here, one there, and a big long road between them, and that's it. No, no, there was many cities in the island. And it's pretty amazing. I'd like to go there one day. But let's talk a little bit about this quotation. I found that um, in history, actually there was a, um, a person that found the, the details about um, the statement. You know, the proverb that was said by one of their own prophets. The quotation which Paul cites is actually from a Greek poet called Epimenides. He lived about 600 BC and held status of one of the seven wise men of Greece. The first phrase, the Cretans are chronic liars, had been found, uh, had been uh, made famous by a later and equally well-known poet called Callimachus. I mean, these guys knew not to lie. <laughs> and they found, like 600 BC, there was a guy, yeah, you know, these guys, they like to lie. And that's the guy who said it. Point number two. The path of most resistance. The path of most resistance. Titus 2, verse 1. I'm going to read the whole paragraph. Um, please, uh, please follow along. Those who don't have a Bible, please lean on over, person next to you. Um, we may even have a spare Bible here. Amen. You, however, must teach what is appropriate and to, to sound doctrine. Teach the older men to be tempered. Remember, we looked at this in one of the previous lessons. So we'll skip over this, but and we'll glean from it. But that won't be the main point of it. Teach the older men to be tempered, with your respect, self-controlled, sound in the faith, in love and endurance. You know what older guys struggle with? Patience. They're not always worthy of respect. And they struggle with self-control. Verse 3. Likewise, teach older women to be reverent in the way they live. Not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but teach what is good. Then they can urge the younger women to love their husbands and children to be self-controlled and pure. See, now we see the older women need to teach the younger women. To, in their in a, uh, self-controlled purity and parenting. To be busy at home, to be kind, to be subject to their husbands. So no one will mind the word of God. See what that teaches right there is if you see a wife who's a Christian and she talks back to her husband and quarreling and all this, it will malign the word of God. Oh, that's what Christians look like. No, I don't want to be a Christian. Verse 6. Somebody encourage young men to be self-controlled. Young men, be self-controlled. <laughs> and everything, set them an example what, by doing what is good. You know, young men, they don't respond to talk. They respond to example. Mm. Oh, you shared your faith with this many people? Oh, uh, you see the young men start doing it. They follow an example. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned. So that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. Teach life to be subject to your masters and everything, and try to please them, not to talk back to them, not to steal from men, but to show that they can be fully trusted. That in every way they will make the teaching of God our Savior attractive. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. And to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this age. 
while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing in glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own eager to do good. These then are the things you should teach. Encourage your rebuke with all authority. Do not let anyone despise you. I mean, this guy had to go in and really teach this church. What's the main theme right here? Every group needs to be self-controlled. Dare we say you've got to be a little disciplined. You know in the gym right there, you work out, and then, you know, you got to look. <laughs> you, you, let's take sit-up. You know, I love this sit-up, and I'm struggling with sit-ups, but I'm telling you. Now, with the sit-up, there's 500 ways in which you can do a sit-up. You can first bring your head up and then that, or some people just go up, you know, like 10 degrees. Uh, some even, they do the leg raises and, and all of that. But then, but then comes someone who's like really, uh, you know, an effective trainer comes to you and say, no, 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 you've got you to hold your legs like this. <laughs> no, no, you've got to hold it. No, you've got to come up to here. I mean, I, that's just what they do. The path of least resistance is just the way you want to do it. Now, I'm going to do a setup in this easy way. <laughs> the path of least resistance. <laughs> you know, of course, I sat with Janet. Janet didn't know what a setup was. I said, um, okay, sit down, um, you know, put your back like this, put your feet up, um, and then I held her feet and I said, okay, sit up. She sat up and I said, you just got to push up. I said, <laughs> <laughs> and she was laughing. <laughs> um, but we need to be self-controlled and disciplined. Look, it's, it's my least favorite topic. I'll be honest. I, I, I hate the concept of lack of discipline being the cause of a problem. I like it. I could do this, this, this problem with this strategy. Oh, this problem with this. Oh, no, no, no. Bro, you've not been disciplined. No, no, bro, that's not the problem. It's a strategy we're taking. No, we need to be disciplined. We need to take the path, path of most resistance. Now I want to lift up my brother, um, <laughs> my, my brother um, Francisco. Uh, this week he's like, oh, how can I help my, my friends out and all that? And of course, I see he started studying the Bible and, and uh, you know, Nila's brother right there. I said, I'm going to get, uh, I'm going to try and get I see a, a job. And so now at uh, Francisco's company, I see he started being like the facilities uh, assistant and whatever. Oh, and, uh, um, you know, and uh, Tommy, at the same time, has been studying the Bible, and we spoke to Tommy, Tommy, you got you to gotta go after, you got to get a job and all that. And then he felt like, oh, I see he's getting a job ahead of me. But you know what? I left up Tommy too. We sat down and studied the Bible and looked at his life and his situation. And in some ways, I had to help him see Genesis 2, verse 24. You know? For that reason, a man will leave his father and mother. There's a time to be kicked out of the nest and so go and earn your own way. Tommy said, you know what? I need to grow in this. Tommy's been around a while and studying the Bible. I'm telling you, watch this man. He's going to do great things for God. Amen. He wants to go out and get a job. He wants to go out. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I remember uh, reading this book about discipline. It's called The Disciplined Life. You know what he tells you in the first chapter? If you look ahead, how many pages is left of the chapter, or you know how long the book is, or whatever, it means you don't have this book. <laughs> I was like, I already knew how long the book was. I mean, that's the first thing I did when I read the book. <laughs> but that guy just nails you in a disciplined life. A short little booklet like this, one of the toughest books I ever read. <laughs> it's a Taylor, someone Taylor. The disciplined life. Richard Taylor. Hmm. We got to be disciplined. You know what takes discipline? Prayer. You know, you know what takes discipline? Prayer. You know what takes discipline as well? Fasting. Have you made a list to pray through yet? The men spoke about it on Wednesday. I have to sit down. Oh man, I've got to really crank it out here. I've got a list now. Amen? Amen. We gotta grow in prayer in this church right here to be disciplined. The young man, are you consistent in going out and praying? 
Are you consistent in everyday things? The brothers and sisters, the parenting. What about our personal hygiene? Yes, what about our eating? I own him up front, so he's going after a diet right there. No, even if it's Coke Zero, I'm not allowed to have it. I guess I'm not having Coke Zero. <laughs> <laughs> going after a diet right there. I'm going to imitate that. What do you lack discipline in? What do you lack self control in? You know, if you go into the same sin repeatedly, it means there's a lack of self control. And one of the things that really helps, can help, for you to go on the path of most resistance right there, is to have accountability. Hey bro, I'm really tempted to do X and Y. I could give you almost all my money. You're not going to do that sin. In addition, it says right here, it's interesting that it's in this very passage, that that famous uh, scripture comes up. It says, in verse 11, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. The grace of God teaches us what? To say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. passions. And to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. I want to challenge the church. We have to be disciplined and excellent. How about being open to different people? You know what takes discipline? It's not to spread your sin. Mm. Ever heard of spreading your sin? Say this, this little, this brother here. Ah, this, this is what I've done. You go to another brother. You done? You done five cents? Oh no, I done this one. You go to another brother. Oh no, I done that one. And then you go to another. So in the end, ah, I confessed all my sins. I'm good, I'm good to go. <laughs> but take discipline to be the same with everyone. Do people know your whole heart? Are you fully open? You know, it's amazing here that it talks about. The grace that Christ had had on us. That Jesus gave himself up. It took discipline for Jesus to do that. You know, um, I remember coming into the office one time and I was like, what does my boss really want from me? I want you to be effective, I thought. You know what he said? I want you to be productive. <laughs> so you can be effective at something and not or necessarily produce that much. Point number three, fruitful and productive. Fruitful and productive. Titus 3 verse 1. Titus, Titus 3 verse 1, coming in for a close. Remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to, to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate, and always to be gentle toward everyone. You know, it says right here that remind people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient. Mm. You know, we live in an age where it's just, if you plagiarize something, it's fine. You didn't pay for that thing. You, you're not the legal owner. Someone else paid for that plagiarized thing you had. There should not be such things in God's church. Mm. We should obey the laws of the land, except where the word supersedes it. Verse 3, at one time we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another, when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared. He saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth by renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us generously through our Lord, through um, Jesus Christ our Savior. And so that, having been justified by His grace, we might become heirs of having the hope of eternal life. Wow. Jesus died for us. We got that washing right there at baptism. Now I have the hope of eternal life. This is an um, trustworthy saying. And I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. You see the theme of doing good there again? These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. But avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law, because these are unprofitable and useless. Warn a divisive person once, and then have nothing to do with them. 
You may be sure that such a person is warped and sinful. They are self-condemned. I mean, the church is, no, is taking no prisoners when it comes to people who are divisive and, you know, idle and all that kind of stuff. It says, want a divisive person once and then want them a second time after that. Have nothing to do with them. But you know what hits me right here from this passage is, is the fact that it talks about doing good and being profitable. we got to make sure we're not only doing good, but we're profitable as disciples. What does that mean? Fruitfulness. John chapter 15. John chapter 15. This is a this is a scripture applies to all disciples. And I put before you, if we are not fruitful, we will fall away. Yeah. Verse 1. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of me that bears no fruit. For every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, so it will be even more fruitful. We don't even have to go further. Jesus the vine, God the gardener. We're the branches. If we bear no fruit, God get cut off. But if we do bear fruit, we're going to get pruned. We're going to get snipped here and snipped there. And like, uh, why? So that you may bear more fruit. Sometimes... God has to prune you a little bit right there for you to be more fruitful. But what's the point? We need to be fruitful and productive. Fruitful and productive. You know, this coming Wednesday is going to be incredible because the women are getting together. But one of the things we spoke of as men was that before Francisco got baptized, you know what we did? We said we're going to fast until we have commitments for people to come on Sundays. Yeah. We did it. Guess what God did? And we were surprised. Oh, wow. God is really... No. If you obey God, it will, it will work. You want to put before you that this week, we've got to fast until each of us have a commitment for a female, for, for a woman to come next Sunday. We're going to help the sisters on now. Last Sunday we said, women are from God. Remember that one? Because yeah. it was International Women's Day. Do you still believe women are from God? Yes. This Wednesday, I want to put before you, on, on Thursday morning, we'll start fasting, and then, you know, Jen's going to preach to the sisters. We're going to be out there with the picnic, the men, we're going to have kids and all that. But come Thursday, we go after our, our um, you know, goal to get a commitment for Sunday. What is a commitment? Uh, I'll see if I can make it. No. Okay. What's a commitment? Someone who says, I'm there. I'm coming. <laughs> now, is it a numbers game? Are we just bums on seats? No, no, no. We're going to after people's hearts. This is a way for us to keep ourselves accountable. I mean, <clears throat> we must go out and reach out. We must be sure that we are fruitful. In conclusion, I want to read you a little passage that really convicted me. Um, Psalm 23. Most of you know it. And how incredible that God has showed us that. But you know what? If you really go and study it, every line, every verse means something. I want us, you may not have it with you, but there's a special translation called the message translation. Mm -hmm. I want to read it to you. God, my shepherd, I don't need a thing. You have bedded me down in lush meadows. You find me quiet pools to drink from. True to your word, you let me catch my breath and send me in the right direction. Even when the way goes through death valley, I'm not afraid. When you walk at my side, your trusty shepherd's crook makes me feel secure. You serve me a six-course dinner right in front of my enemies. You revive my drooping head. My cup brims with blessing. Your beauty and love 
chase after me every day of my life. I'm back home in the house of God for the rest of my life. And to God be all the glory. Amen. Amen.